We're going to get started a little bit earlier because Professor Suleiman has a full lecture and we want to have time for Q&A and of course this program is kind of wedged between classes today. My name is Wendy Lauer. I'm the John K. Roth Professor of History and I'm Director of the McGooblian Center for Human Rights and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor Susan Rubin Suleiman, who was born in Budapest and emigrated to the U.S. with her parents as a child. She obtained her BA from Barnard College and her PhD from Harvard University. She's been on the faculty at Harvard since 1981. She's the author of more than 100 articles and the co-author or author of about a dozen books, a very prolific writer. Uh, among them, of course, the topic of today's, the lecture topic of today, the Nemirovsky question, the life, death, and legacy of a Jewish writer in 20th century France. Um, I would like to mention another book I think it's interesting is Budapest Diary, In Search of the Mother Book, a Memoir About Hungary. Her talk today is uh, occurring in conjunction with a special exhibit that is here at the Claremont Colleges that opened on January 22nd and will remain open until the 28th of February at the Clark Humanities Museum. I'm very pleased to be coordinating this and collaborating with colleagues at Scripps, Emily uh, Garagon Kempton, who brought this exhibit, this traveling exhibit, on Helene Baer um, to the Claremont Colleges. And uh, Jacques Frege, who's coming this weekend for programming, he's the director of the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris. Helene Baer is another female victim of the Holocaust in France. And like Irene Nemirovsky, the subject of our talk today, she was deported to Auschwitz. We're so grateful to Professor Solomon to, because she's bringing to our attention, she's becoming part of, in her scholarship, uh, what is emerging as a kind of belle lettre of, of Jewish victim testimony, Nemirovsky's writings, for instance, and then Helene Baer. So it's both of these women, Jewish women, um, found themselves in Nazi-occupied Paris. 75,000 Jews were deported from France during the Holocaust. 96% of those who were deported were killed. This was done with the uh, blatant collaboration of the French government, including their construction of camps, the use of their railway system, the SNCF, the, uh, the, the French police. Um, and it's really uh, the story of collaboration. I just mentioned this because, and that's why I mentioned Jacques Frege at the Memorial de la Shoah. A lot of this material is just being declassified now, millions and millions of pages. Um, that are coming out of the French archives, Ministry of Defense archives, and so that story is to be continued. And the story of collaboration started in France, uh, and now I think we're going to um, take another, a closer look with all this material. In the millions of victims that we speak of in the Holocaust, the six million, and the millions more pages, the tens of millions of pages that document the vast European machinery of displacement, deportation, and mass murder, it's easy to lose sight of the experience of one Jewish victim or one, even one Jewish family. And we're just so grateful to Professor Solomon for shining a light on such, one such victim, Irene Nemirovsky, and why her biography matters to us. The last thing I wanted to mention is that Professor Solomon, I just found out, was awarded France's highest honor, the Légion d'honneur, and she will be receiving that medal in a few weeks in Cambridge. So we want to congratulate her on the, of such a high honor <laughs> and welcome her to the stage. Oh, I think I left my reading classes. Always oh, very important. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Wendy, and, uh, and thank you very much to Kirsty, who has been so helpful, and I'm very happy to see Natalie again, Natalie Raiklin, and to meet Emily. Uh, so it's very nice to be here uh, in Southern California, where I actually lived for a few years, many years ago, and have some very fond memories uh, of it. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk to you this morning or this noon about a woman who died uh, more than 75 years ago, and that's a rather bad image. I'm sorry, I apologize because her part of her head is cut off. Uh, 
but whose uh, life and death have become, unfortunately, all too timely and relevant. Irene Demirovsky was an immigrant to France, uh, one of the huge wave of Russian emigres who left Russia after the 1917 revolution. Uh, and since uh, her family and she were Jewish, uh, she also belongs to the enormous wave of Jewish uh, immigrants to France who arrived between the two world wars, uh, fleeing, uh, especially in, uh, starting in the 1930s, fleeing uh, Nazism. Uh, uh, and uh, just like the uh, refugees from Syria and Africa who are arriving uh, by boatloads uh, in Europe and North America today, those earlier exiles were and migrants uh, were not always greeted with open arms, uh, to put it mildly. Even wealthy middle-class immigrants like Nemirovsky, uh, we'll find out in, in a bit about her family, uh, they were often treated as undesirable foreigners. That was actually a category in French law, undesirable foreigner, uh, and uh, increasingly so in the 1930s um, when Europe became ever more infected with the disease of aggressive nationalisms that led to the disaster of World War II. I don't need to insist too much on the danger signs that suggest parallels to that terrible period in today's world, uh, and I'm sure we're all aware of them, which doesn't mean that history will repeat itself. I just want to say that. But When I first began working on my book about Nemirovsky, and that's the book that uh, Wendy Lower referred to, uh, which, is, which is this one, uh, the Nemirovsky question, <clears throat> Uh, uh, I began working on it close to 10 years ago, and the parallels, you know, with the earlier period were not yet obvious, although we were already living after 9-11. Uh, the hopes and optimism of the 1990s, when the fall of communism in Europe had raised high expectations for, um, for democracy uh, in, uh, after, after the fall of, of communism, um, has since then, uh, have since then faded somewhat, unfortunately, and the mood in many places in Europe has become quite a bit darker. Uh, um, you know, here we elected a president whose uh, two slogans were America first, which was a throwback to the 1930s, to a famous slogan in the 1930s, and build a wall. Now, in Europe, right-wing nationalists were at the same time rising to power and influence in Poland, Hungary, but also Austria, Germany, and Italy. And France narrowly uh, missed electing a woman whose party's slogan for many, many years was La France aux Français, French, uh, France to the French. Uh, this was around the time that my book was actually published almost uh, a little over two years ago in 2016. Uh, so just to show you the way things had changed. Uh, now, <clears throat> what all these nationalists on both sides of the Atlantic have in common is a fear and hatred of outsiders, those who are different from the majority, who don't belong, whose religion or ethnicity or sexual orientation or whatever you category you choose, they see as a threat to the identity of the nation. This loathing of the outsider, of the stranger who is not like us, is the common thread that links the nationalism of the 1930s uh, with those of the present. Um, so now I'd like to tell you more about Nemirovsky uh, as I present her in my book. Uh, and my book uh, is sort of two-headed in a way. It tells a story. And it also presents an argument. Uh, so first, let's do the story, which has nice pictures to go with it. Uh, Irene Nemirovsky was born in Kiev in 1903, at a time when that was still part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and um, into what was, by the time she was born, a fairly wealthy family. Uh, here's a picture of Irene around age six, dressed in a, in a, uh, in a sailor suit. You can see she looks prosperous, uh, or from a prosperous family. Uh, her father was, had become a wealthy uh, businessman, uh, but he was a self-made man, was called a self-made man. His background was that of a very poor, uh, of many, that of, 
His background was similar to that of many other Jews of the period, that is, his own family were Yiddish-speaking Jews living in a poor neighborhood in Odessa, uh, but he rose to become, uh, to become uh, quite uh, wealthy and, uh, you know, uh, with uh, middle-class aspirations or, or even achievements. Uh, he married a woman who was already, uh, also a Jewish woman, who was uh, already from a family that no longer spoke Yiddish, uh, but, uh, and spoke French mostly at home, and who had even higher pretensions. This conflict, in a way, between the wealthy, or, or at least, no, the, the, the more upper class Jews and the lower class Jews was a blight motif in many of Demirovsky's fiction uh, uh, novels, and it's something that we know about, that uh, historians of Jews in Europe have often talked about, you know, the kind of, uh, of tensions that arise when parts of a minority uh, rise while others don't, and the, and the ambivalences that, that, that uh, occur. Uh, so we could talk about that in a minute. Here is a picture of Irene at around age 16 with her father, as you can see, he looks like a very fine gentleman, uh, and she adored her father, as you can see here. Uh, her relation with her mother was a little bit more fraught, uh, shall we say. Uh, uh, you can see that she practically wants to, you know, keel over, doesn't want to touch her mother, uh, and her, the look on her, in her eyes is really uh, deadly. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a very good photograph because, uh, in fact, in Nimirovsky's fiction, uh, just like uh, there, there is very often, most of her families are unhappy families. I mean, uh, you know, like Tolstoy's unhappy family, uh, with a lot of conflict uh, between the, uh, or sort of mismatched couples. Uh, there are a few matched couples, but not too many. Uh, and uh, then uh, the other big light motif, as far as family goes, is the utter loathing between mothers and daughters. Uh, there is really, or very often it's the daughter who loathes the mother, partly because the mother is extremely narcissistic and would rather not be a mother. As you can see here, her mother was a good-looking woman, uh, well-dressed, uh, very much concerned with her own appearance, and was not very maternal, from what we can tell. So, so this loathing comes partly from a sense of being unloved, uh, a, a child who does not feel loved by her mother. Uh, so in 1920, so this was a lot of good material for Nemirovsky to work with. Uh, and in 1929, uh, at age 26. Meanwhile, I should say the family had arrived in France. Uh, they left, uh, they left uh, Russia in 1917, very soon after the revolution, and after you know, a while wandering around Europe, they arrived in France uh, two years later when she was 16. So, uh, and by the time she went to university and so on, and by the time she was 26 in 1929, uh, she had already published a few small things and then published a book that became a huge, huge literary success. Uh, it was called David Golder, or David Golder was the title of the book, and it earned her instant fame as a young uh, emigre writer uh, and became also uh, adapted to the movies. This is the poster for the movie that was made of the film in 1930 by, uh, by Julien Duvivier, one of the really great filmmakers uh, in France. This was his first talkie with a very fine actor, Harry Bauer, playing the title role of, uh, of David Golder. So I'll say a few words about that book in a, a little bit later. But uh, this book really transformed um, Demirovsky's life because she became one of the extremely few women writers in France from that point on uh, who were recognized and, and respected by the literary establishment uh, and earned their living through their pen. That combination was, not, was very rare. The only other woman at the time who could claim that sort of both respect and commercial success was Colette. Uh, but Colette was 30 years older than Nemirovsky. So Nemirovsky, despite being a woman, despite being a Jew, uh, was, had a huge uh, sort of a wonderful success for a number of years. Uh, and I, uh, not only professional, but personal. In 1926, she married a 
a man who was similar to her in background. His name was Michel Epstein. He, as you can see, he too came from a privileged family. His father was a banker. He was a, they were Jewish immigrants uh, from Russia. Uh, uh, and they had two children. Uh, the uh, older one, this was a photo taken in September 1939, just, or August 1939, excuse me, just before the outbreak of World War I. Uh, uh, in southern France, in southwestern France, where they went on vacation. Here is Irene, Michel, their daughter Denise, and their little daughter um, Elisabeth, who was two at the time, and Denise was about 12. Uh, so, uh, no, sorry, uh, she, she was 10. But, but Denise was born in 1929. So, uh, this is, uh, Denise later talked about this photo as the last photo of a happy family. Uh, because, uh, well, we know what happened next, but I just want to just say, so, so both professionally and personally, she had a huge success. And here's one more image of uh, Irene Nemirovsky at the height of her fame, if you will. This is an author photo taken of her in 1938. You can see that e emphasized is her pen and her notebook. This is what she does. This is, she, she's a woman of letters. She's a, she's a writer and a very successful one, beautifully dressed in her library, et cetera. Okay, then comes World War II and it, everything gets destroyed. Um, uh, in July 1942, she was arrested in the small town where the family had taken refuge uh, in Burgundy and uh, taken to a camp not too far away, about 150 miles north, the camp of Pithiviers, and within days, less than a day after, a day after she arrived at the camp, she was deported, along with uh, uh, almost a thousand other Jews, to Auschwitz and died there a month later at the age of 39. Uh, and I just thought uh, I would show you what her uh, card looked like. This is the camp of Pithiviers. Her name was Epstein, Epstein Ne. Nemirovsky, they completely massacre the, the uh, spelling of her name. And then, but they got the profession right, femme de lettres, woman of letters. Uh, there's a kind of horrible irony in that, uh, in this card. Uh, this tells us where, what barrack and what bed she was assigned to. Uh, and also, uh, she arrived on the 16th, and she was handed over that very day to the uh, authorities to uh, Remy, this is the most chilling part of this card, Remy a o, which means handed over to authorities of occupation on the 16th of July, 1942. The next morning, the transport left for Auschwitz. Uh, so the authorities of occupation were, of course, the Germans. Uh, but the uh, Pithiviers camp was run entirely, as Wendy pointed out, uh, was run entirely by French, by French police. Uh, so um, so uh, a few months later, her husband, Michel, was arrested and taken to Auschwitz and gassed. Uh, so both of them died very quickly. But uh, if there's a happy uh, aspect of the story, if you will, is that their two daughters survived. They were taken care of by a woman who worked for the family. And uh, here's, here are images. Here's are the two girls during the good times. You can see how beautifully dressed they are. And you know, this is around 1938. And this is 1943, when they're looking a little bit more bedraggled with hand-me-down clothes, uh, but they're alive. Uh, and that is the most important thing, in a way, um, because uh, they were to play a very important role in this story when they grew up. Now, so let's say after the war, uh, many years of forgetfulness, Demirovsky is com uh, completely sinks into oblivion. Even though she had been famous in her lifetime, she, nobody remembers her. And suddenly in 2004, uh, what happens in 2004? Sweet Francaise is published, which is a novel that she was working on in 1942 when she was deported, so over 60 years before her death. It was never published until then. Uh, 
Uh, who has read that book? Anybody? Yes, some of you have read that book. Uh, so, as you know, it's a really great novel, uh, at least I think. Uh, it is a really wonderful novel about the first year of the German occupation in France. The novel takes place between June 1940 and June 1941, so one full year. Uh, and uh, it became, for good reason, an immediate huge bestseller. It won a uh, a major literary prize, the Prix Renaudot, and then was translated into 30 languages. So it transformed literally the lives of uh, the whole family. I mean, uh, the, the beautiful part of this whole story is that it was Denise who published, uh, Denise, the older daughter, who published this novel. The younger daughter, Elisabeth, had made a very good career as, an, as a publisher, as an editor and publisher in New York, and unfortunately, by 2004, she had died of cancer. But she, too, had contributed to her mother's um, rebirth, in a way, because uh, in 1992, a few years before she died, she published a book about her, and that was the first time that people in France began to talk a little bit about this forgotten novelist named Irene Nemirovsky. But it was really with, with the publication of Suite Française that she became quite very well known. Uh, now, I just want to say that this novel, I highly recommend it to everybody, and uh, we don't have time to you know, go into it in detail, but I just want to say the thing about this novel that is so fascinating is uh, I, I sort of compare it to uh, like a letter found in a bottle on the sand uh, because it was written uh, then, but, we read, but, but, but the public that read it was, uh, knew a lot more than the author who had written it, right? The, the author wrote it in 1942, and what she was writing about was the history of her own days. That is, she was writing about the present, but she was writing a war novel, and in fact, the novel begins with the very famous uh, exit of people from, Fran from Paris as they're heading south, because the Germans are heading south also. This is known as the Exodus uh, from Paris, uh, and it's an absolutely stunning portrayal of what happens when you know thousands of people reach, are on the roads, uh, uh, heading out of a out of a out of a city that is about to be occupied by the enemy. So that's part one, and part two takes place in an occupied village, uh, um, and tells a very interesting sort of aborted love story. Uh, but uh, the point about this is that Demirovsky is writing a war novel, but unlike Tolstoy, you know, who wrote War and Peace, and that was one of her big models, uh, uh, Tolstoy wrote War and Peace 50 years after uh, the War of 1812, uh, uh, the Napoleonic War, whereas Demirovsky was writing practically the day it happened. So. So her, she was writing a historical novel, but, uh, but in the present, and yet what this novel shows is a gaze, what I call you know, the, the, the gaze of the outsider, because the person who is looking at everything is in fact somebody who is outside, uh, who feels excluded. One of the first entries in her diary around that time was, my God, what is this country doing to me? Since it is excluding me, let us observe as she loses her honor and her life. So Nemirovsky is pitiless, you know, uh, in the way she describes the reaction of the French elite to the arrival of the Germans. You know, people run away, but then they go back, and eventually, you know, the, the bourgeoisie, if you will, uh, accommodates itself to the presence of the German officers in France, uh, so or in Paris. I mean, they're not happy with it, obviously, but, but somehow there are accommodations. And she shows all this, and, and my uh, feeling is that, you know, people sometimes say, why aren't there any Jewish characters in this book? And it's true, there aren't. She's really more interested in the reaction of you know, ordinary French people to this. Uh, but there is a Jewish presence, as far as I know, as far as I'm concerned, in the book. And that presence is the narrator. That is, it's not a character, but it's the narrative voice, the narrative perspective is that of somebody who is really looking at things with a kind of, uh, 
of a skeptical, critical eye that, underst that uh, understands people's motivations in a way that is very unusual for uh, somebody writing about the present moment. Uh, so that is why I think it's a great and very paradoxical historical novel, uh, since it's both historical and a novel of the present. Um, so, um, so okay, uh, uh, the rest of the story is actually quite uh, happy. Well, here is a picture actually of Elizabeth, the younger daughter at the time that she wrote her book about her mother. This was in 1992. And then with the publication of, of, the, um, of, of uh, Sweet Francaise in 2004, uh, Denise also had her moment of glory because she became a little celebrity of her own. She traveled the world. She was by then almost, she was about 75. She traveled the world, all over the world, invited to talk about her mother and about the book. And, you know, it, it's just an incredible story. And then her own daughter, her, her own children, uh, her niece and nephew, her sister's children, their children, if they had any, uh, they all discovered that they had this heritage, you know, that they were the, the descendants of a, of a famous writer. Uh, it, some of them hadn't been very much aware of this. And also, let's face it, commercially even, it was, it, it brought uh, Denise, who had always been very poor all her life, she suddenly could buy herself a nice new apartment in Toulouse, you know. So this was a great moment, and I have this great picture of Denise and her daughter Irene, her daughter N Irene, named after Irene Nemirovsky, and her granddaughter Juliette on the other side. So three generations of this family who are looking very, very happy <laughs> in Toulouse in 2011, which is when I took this photo. Uh, uh, I should say that Denise was an extraordinary uh, person. I interviewed her many, several times, and, and uh, uh, she, was, she was quite a woman. Uh, here I am with her, actually, in 2010. Uh, and the best part, in a way, is that, you know, the redemption part or the good part of the story, this is the Place, the, the, the town square in Issy Levesque, the village where, uh, where Nemirovsky was arrested. And that house is where she and her family lived when she was arrested. Uh, and now this square, which used to be called the Place du Monument, because there's a monument to the dead. This is the monument to World War I and World War II dead, as you find in many French villages. This now is called Place Irene Nemirovsky. Uh, uh, which uh, it was done in 2005. So Denise went and, and did the inauguration and so on. So the story is really great. Okay, I think we're done with our slideshow. Oh, yes, well, this is the other part which I think is interesting is Denise and her sister uh, are buried in the r Jewish section of a cemetery in, fr in uh, Paris, the Belleville Cemetery. And you see on the, on the tombstone, is not only her name, uh, 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 and also this would be her sister. We don't have her sister's name, but over here, Nemirovsky uh, uh, and her, Michelle Epstein was also mentioned here. I obviously don't have it. Mort à Auschwitz. So this is very common in French cemeteries where uh, people who uh, who have lost family members, who obviously those family members' ashes or, or, or bodies are not findable, but their names are often inscribed on tombstones. So that's the end of the story. Uh, okay, now, what about the argument? Uh, well, the argument comes about because of the rest of the story, because what happened is that after the publication of Sweet Francaise, uh, when Nemirovsky became you know, quite well known. Her publisher published all the books that, sh that many of, most of which had become out of print. David Golder, you know, that first one never went out of print actually, but it was pretty much unknown. Uh, so now all these books came back. Uh, and some readers uh, in France, as well as in the United States, especially in the United States and in uh, England, were shocked because what they discovered was that uh, Nemirovsky's characters, Jewish characters, not all her books were about Jews, in fact, most of them weren't, but her best books, I think, are in fact about Jews, uh, and that those characters, in the eyes of many readers, were anti-Semitic stereotypes. So suddenly, 
Uh, and, and also what was discovered, that was a biography of, uh, before mine, but you know, uh, Nemirovsky had converted to Catholicism in 1939 with her husband. She had published uh, stories in a uh, weekly newspaper, which uh, started out as fairly liberal, but then moved to become quite horribly anti-Semitic. Uh, and she continued publishing there, partly because she needed the money. But anyway, so all these negative things came out of the woodwork, as it were. And suddenly, this phenomenon, a very strange phenomenon, happened, which is that she went from being a great victim of the Holocaust to a kind of hateful figure. And you have some people, some critics, who have, you know, who suddenly tar her with a label, ah, a Jewish anti-Semite, a self-hating Jew. Yes, we should be sorry that she was killed in Auschwitz, but boy, was she ever a horrible person. Uh, uh, and, and all her books are awful. Uh, and, these, and David Golder is a, is, a, is a horrible book, and you should read it. Uh, well, I wrote my book. I have to say, partly in a large part, not just to tell this story, which I thought was wonderful, but to counter that argument by, because I really feel that it's very simpli sim simplistic. Uh, so I wanted to see whether we could have a more uh, generous view of Nemirovsky's life and her career choices, and also whether there was a way of reading her fiction, because I personally did not find it anti-Semitic, so how come? How come I didn't find it anti-Semitic, and yet other people did? You know, this was my problem. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what she does in her novels with Jewish characters, and, but other people say, oh no, this is horrible, these are anti-Semitic stereotypes. So, uh, so I, I wrote my book, okay, I wanted to, on the one hand, look at her, uh, career and life and career choices uh, in the 20s and 30s until later when she had no choice anymore in, in the early 1940s during the war. But for example, she married a man just like herself. That's pretty interesting. Uh, instead of marrying some, finding some nice French guy who could give her French citizenship, incidentally, they never, neither she nor Michel became French. And that was, in fact, why they were deported so quickly. They were considered foreign Jews, so they were foreigners, okay? Uh, um, so she married a man very much like herself. Uh, that was an interesting career choice. On the other hand, she wanted to be a member of the Académie Française. That was her ideal, you know, the French Academy, very stuffy. Uh, so. So that was, she didn't want to be an avant-garde writer. She didn't want to be part of the, she wasn't a revolutionary. She was, you know, kind of an establishment type. Okay, well, how do we read this? Uh, but mainly also, I wanted to see if we could read the books about Jewish characters in a way that corresponded to what my experience of it was rather than to what the very unsympathetic was. And I'll just give you an example from uh, David Golder, okay? That, that first novel, David Golder. It's a story of a Jewish businessman who rises from being very, very poor, from a dirt poor family in Odessa to very, being very, very wealthy. And yet he's very unhappy. He, he hates his wife. His wife hates him. He, he, you know, uh, yes, he loves his daughter, but she's selfish and flighty and so forth. And you know, this is a not. This is a topos. This is a, a story we know. You know, like what makes Sammy run in American literature, or uh, the rise of David Levinsky, a famous American novel about. It's the story of you know the the guy who become who was poor becomes rich, but doesn't become happy. Uh, this could be any number of people. It doesn't have to be a Jew, but there is the Jewish version. This is what David Golder is mainly about, okay? Uh, and I think she, she really captures something in this novel about what it means to be a Jew in modern times. Uh, because not only does David Golder, uh, it, not only is he kind of isolated in terms of French society, uh, he, he lives in a cocoon almost, like he doesn't have much contact with any French people. Uh, but he also has very complicated relationships with other Jews. Uh, and this is the really interesting thing about Nemirovsky that she zeroes in on. Uh, and it's what I call sort of living the Jewish question 
uh, for Jews. Because what Jews had to contend with in the first half of the 20th century was the question, what is my relationship to the mainstream on the one hand? And very often the recognition was, I'm sorry, I will never be accepted. No matter what I do to try to belong, I will never be fully accepted by the others who look on me as a stranger, uh, right? That's what my title is, a foreigner and a stranger. You could be, you don't have to be a foreigner to be a stranger, right? Uh, but Nimirovsky was both a foreigner and a stranger, and so are all her Jewish characters. Uh, uh, so that's on the one hand, this is the, the Jewish question for Jews. What's my relation to the mainstream? It's not a happy one. And secondly, what's my relation to other Jews? Uh, because in her, in her world, when you have a, a, uh, a Jewish person who has made, you know, who has risen socially, then the question is, what is their relationship to poor Jews? Uh, and you know, Kafka put it very well, it, not in social terms, but in existential terms. He asks himself in his, in his uh, diary at one point, what have I in common with the Jews? I don't even have anything in common with myself. Uh, so this, this uh, existential questioning and this existential unease about what it means to be a Jew uh, uh, in relation to the non-Jewish majority and in relation to other Jews who aren't like you. Uh, th these are the main uh, issues that Demirovsky deals with. And the way I read her work is that they're not signs of, the, her portrayals of Jews, which are not happy ones, uh, are not signs of her anti-Semitism. They are signs of her understanding that of Jewish unease, if you will, uh, in, uh, in the modern world, uh, uh, certainly for uh, assimilated or acculturated Jews. I mean, this question does not occur if you're a very traditional Orthodox Jew who live in your own world and there's no question for you of what it means to be a Jew. But the people that she's interested in are the uh, sort of the, the, the Jews who entered the mainstream after the Enlightenment, after the 18th century in Europe, and wanted to be like other people, right? These are the up, upwardly mobile Jews, and, and they are the ones that have these complicated, conflicted relationship to their Jewishness, uh, just like she herself did, incidentally. Uh, so, so let's say that uh, that is my way of kind of reading her without doing away with any of the troubling parts of her. Because sometimes, you know, when I read her and she says something nasty, I wince, you know, she says he had big ears or, you know, that he looked anxious uh, like all Jews or something like that. Uh, I say, oh God, couldn't you not have written that? Uh, but, but, you know, I kind of let it go because I don't think of her as an anti-Semite. And my trump card, if you could put it that way, uh, of my, in my argument is this. If you compare Demirovsky's novels and portrayals of Jews to what you find in the work of real anti-Semites, of French anti-Semites, there's a huge difference. Because what you find in their work is us versus them. Jews are them, we are us, the French, and never the two shall meet, uh, okay? Or they will never be like us. What you find in Nemirovsky is them versus them. In other words, David Golder and the Jew that he doesn't like because he looks too Jewish. Uh, you know, there's never uh, a pitting of Jews against the French in a bad way. If anything, at one point in one of her novels, the heroine, who is a Jewish immigrant from Russia, looks at the French and calls them them. So she turns it around. It's not them, the Jews, against us, the French. It's them, the French. Uh, so the, the, what is missing in her work and what makes it not anti-Semitic, in my opinion, is precisely that she does not do this kind of splitting of us versus them, where the Jew occupies a negative pole of a, of a, of a bipolar world. Uh, so I just want to end now, because we don't have too much time, uh, but I would just say that, you know, is there, is there anything to be taken away for today from reading Nemirovsky? And 
I mean, on the one hand, I think what we learn from reading her books uh, is that it's not easy to be a foreigner and a stranger, uh, the way Jews uh, in Europe were for many, many decades uh, in the 20th century. Uh, it's a complicated relationship which involved negotiating uh, both your relation to the other members of the minority and to the mainstream, and uh, and it's uh, to her credit, I think, that she was able to look at that and to let us, you know, understand what that, what those conflicts and contradictions in identity uh, can mean. And this doesn't only concern Jews; it concerns any kind of despised minority. Uh, okay, that's number one. And then it seems to me that um, as we think about her tragic uh, history uh, and that of other. Uh, feared and hated outsiders uh, uh, since then, um, in her time and in ours, uh, I think what we have to be able to say is that history, that, that we are not helpless in the face of history, that, that history does not uh, necessarily repeat itself, and that we are free to, uh, to make sure that it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for? Yes? Thank you for your talk. It was fascinating. I have not read the novel. I will now. But I did see the film. I don't know how close that is to the novel. And I was. Which one? The David Golder film? Uh, no, The Sweet Frances. Oh, Sweet Frances. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and I was uh, fascinated by one part where they talk about neighbors writing letters against other neighbors and all these kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, intra spionage or, or whatever. Uh, how is that treated in the novel? Is it as. Uh, um, is it now, an important part of her psychological portrayal uh, of what was going on in the town? Okay. Uh, first of all, now, now the film, which is not bad, actually. I've seen it a couple of times now, Sweet Frances. Uh, it's an English language film. It came out about three or four years ago. Uh, uh, it only deals with the second half of the novel. That is, it does not deal with that whole wonderful part about the exodus from Paris. It's to life in the village, in the occupied village. Uh, and terrific cast, you know. Uh, uh, Kristen Scott Thomas and Michelle Williams and so on. But uh, uh, in so these letters of denunciation uh, are famous. Historians have studied them a lot. They're in the archive. You know, somebody writes a letter to the German head of the police. You know, saying my neighbor listens to London radio. You know, uh, so and, and very often that neighbor happens to have a shop just like yours, so you got rid of a competitor, you know, or whatever. And there were also letters denouncing Jews. So and so is is actually a Jew, or so and so is hiding a Jew in the attic. Or uh, these letters of denunciation were written by French people, uh, either denouncing Jews or denouncing other French people who did stuff that was against the against the rules. It's not, it doesn't play a huge role in the novel, actually. Uh, very little. In fact, I don't, I barely recall, I don't even know if there was any. I, I don't think so. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah? Oh. Thanks. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, my question is about this sort of uh, usage of perhaps anti-Semitic tropes, or um, and you mentioned her her conversion to Catholicism. I, I'm wondering if uh, you can if it's possible that she was so distressed over over uh, anti-Semitism um, growing throughout Europe uh, during the late 30s that she wanted to uh, do what she could to distance herself from that and and you know last ditch effort to convert to catholicism to avert uh, catastrophe that kind of thing uh, it, do you think that's possible that well her daughter denise whenever that issue came up you know of uh, of the conversion she always said oh she did that to try to protect us uh, uh, I, I, if you read my book, I mean, it, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's still, you're not wrong, I think, uh, in many things, because 
more complicated because I think she had a genuine interest in Catholicism at one point. She was reading the Gospels, and she writes about it in her journal uh, in her own way. I mean, you know, she, had, she I think at one point she says something like, Jesus was a God that is to say a man like us or something like that. I mean, in other words, not very orthodox uh, doctrine. Uh, but, um, but, but I think her main desire, at least as far as I can see from her journal entries, is a desire to find, uh, to find security. Th this is not the same as saying, let's convert so that they won't pers persecute us. It's a, it's a much more deep thing. And, and uh, what you realize when you read her, uh, her, no her journals is that she was an extremely insecure person. Uh, she was worried, she was constantly worried about money for one thing, uh, which may explain, of course, why she would do things like publish in, in that anti-Semitic weekly, because she, she was always worried that there wouldn't be enough. She had become the sole breadwinner of the family in the war. She became the sole breadwinner. Her husband, who worked in a bank, was fired. But even before then, she earned a lot more money than he did. So. So and then after her father died, uh, uh, you know she was she had nobody to rely on, she, uh, and she just had this horrible uh, fear that she wouldn't have enough. You know she, they lived a very nice middle class, you know bourgeois lifestyle. So there was a very deep sense of insecurity. She also had terrible depressions that she sometimes writes about in her journal about her black mood, her black mood, uh, and. I think the conversion to Catholicism was at least on a, so on a much more deep level than mere, you know, let's protect ourselves, much more deep level. Maybe if I become like everybody else, maybe if I, if I become a Catholic the way most French people are, then I will find s security. Uh, and there are many uh, entries, and not many, but a number of, of entries in her journal which suggest that. Uh, says, I think at one point she writes something like, we cannot, uh, we cannot stop desiring, but we can stop being afraid. Uh, so, you know, uh, these are the kinds of things that she was writing about at the time when she was converting. Uh, so, so your idea that she was looking for some deep sense of security, I think, is 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 correct. Uh, you know, a, a number of, of uh, th there weren't that many conversions in France by Jews because French, uh, because France is well known for having been open. You know, the Republic. Uh, uh, you don't have to convert in order to rise in the army or rise in the bureaucracy or whatever. But there were some famous conversions. Uh, and very often, it, the people who converted then wrote about it and said, you know, it's because one of the reasons was that uh, it was our way of becoming even more French, you know, to declare our Frenchness. Uh, since we are living in a, in, in a Catholic country, let us become, you know, uh, let us take the final step, uh, you know. But of course, it is a way of distancing yourself from, from the group, uh, no question. Uh, Yes? Pardon me? Um, thank you very much for your presentation and for taking this Q&A. I wanted to know the history of the publication. How come it took 60 years for the... Oh. <laughs> There's a law, there are many pages in my book. Uh, okay. To give you the nutshell version, the legend is, here was this notebook uh, in a suitcase that was given to Denise by her father before he was deported, and he said, guard this with your life, don't ever let it go. Uh, then she did, but then it took 60 years for her to open the thing and read it. So this is like ridiculous, right? Uh, she didn't completely contradict this little legend because it's very pretty legend. There, there are parts of it that are true, actually. There, it's like all legends, you know, part of it is true. Uh, what happened is that it was in a suitcase. The suitcase was kept for a number of years, not by Denise, but by this woman who saved her and her, and her sister. And when that woman died in, the, in around 56, so she hung on to it for a, a dozen years, you know. Uh, when she died, uh, Denise came into the possession of the suitcase, which had in it a manuscript of a novel, not this, but another one that was published right away, and fell totally flat 
unbelievable. Nobody was interested in Nemirovsky in 1956. Nobody. Uh, the, the, everything had moved on already. French literature was no longer where, where it had been. They weren't interested. So, <coughs> so in the meanwhile, there was this novel, Suite Francaise, there, and Denise actually knew about it and, and, and said so, and it was mentioned in a newspaper article that I found. Uh, so, but it was considered that, it, well, it wasn't finished. Demirovsky had great plans for continuing it, although I think it has a real coherence the way it is now, but she wanted to continue it. So number one, it was considered, okay, unfinished. Uh, and uh, that was the main, the main reason given, you know, as to why she waited or why they, she and her sister waited then even after the 70s and the 80s. It's not clear, it's not clear. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of people, I interviewed people about it, and some said, oh, Elizabeth was opposed to it because she didn't think it was as good as it could be. It would have been better if her mother had lived to revise it, et cetera, et cetera. So as it happens though, it's a good thing it was published when it was because if it had been published in the 50s, nobody would have read it. Or, you know, it wouldn't have had the effect that it did when when it came out, people were dying for, you know, not dying, but there was a huge hunger for stuff about Jews and the war, and, you know. Uh, so that's why it, you know, it had the effect that it, that it did. But if you want to read the details, <laughs> read the Nemirovsky question. Okay, are we done? Okay.